Welcome to today's webinar, Cyber Careers for Non-Technical Students. I'm your moderator, Jimmy Baker with Cal Poly's California Cybersecurity Institute. Before we get started today, I wanna to thank everyone from all over America for joining us for what I believe will be a very riveting topic. We have a few housekeeping items. If you just can read the information on your screen, today's presentation will be recorded. There'll be time for your questions. Please use, use the chat feature on your Zoom screen to submit questions and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Real quick, a brief agenda. We're gonna hear a word from NICE. I'm gonna interview the panelists. I have a few questions for each of them and then we're gonna open it up to you, the audience. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Davina Pruitt Mental. Davina. Yes, thank you so much. And I wanted to, to thank Jimmy and Cal Poly California Cybersecurity Institute for allowing me to share at this non-technical cybersecurity career opportunities webinar to help support 2020 National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week. I know Cal Poly has been at the forefront in career exploration um, for, especially for, for cybersecurity for their students. And I'm so excited about this and the many other efforts. They have a tour and a mini competition tomorrow and a larger competition that they host every year. So NICE is thrilled to see the impact that your group has made. And I look forward to helping um, wherever we can in, in future efforts. Thanks, Davina. Um, <clears throat> so again, my name is Davina Pruitt Mental. I serve as a lead for academic engagement within the NICE program office. That's the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. It's led by NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and part of the US Department of of commerce. And so before going on, I just want to make sure that everyone is participating in National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week. Uh, today is day four, and I hope that you will help us spread the word about why cybersecurity is so important and that um, if you're in the career, you share. If you're, if you're thinking about it, that you're consider. So for those of you who might not um, I know many of you know what NICE is about, but in case uh, there are some folks who don't, the mission of NICE is to energize and promote and to coordinate a robust uh, community working together to advance an integrated ecosystem of cybersecurity education and training and workforce development. And we do this through a number of ways, but the key is through serving as a convener. So we use this um, quilt analogy as a way to view NICE as a means of pulling all the different government, academia, industry partners, anybody who's interested in, in cybersecurity workforce development, which is basically everybody nowadays, but pulling them together, but in a way that we make a collective whole. So they are all moving forward together in the same, um, with the same goal in mind. So the next slide. So there are many resources that you'll find at nist.gov slash nice, but I wanted to just highlight two that you can view on your own. One is the NICE strategic plan and the other is the National K-12 Cybersecurity Implementation Plan. The next slide. The NICE strategic plan is due every five years and the new plan was just released a couple of weeks ago. And the strategic plan provides a roadmap to really prepare and grow and sustain the cybersecurity uh, workforce, not only for safeguards and protects America's national security, but it really helps in the economic prosperity of it. And so we spent the past year uh, uh, working with the community uh, to see what has worked well in the past strategic plan, the previous one, and then what do we need to advance uh, uh, to advance the mission forward. And five goals surfaced, and you can learn more about the particular objectives and the other um, actions and the measurable outcomes that we'll be looking at. But the five are promoting the discovery of cybersecurity careers and pathways, and that is really key to this particular uh, webinar. Transforming learning, modernizing the talent management process, expanding the use of the NICE framework, and driving research on effective practices for cybersecurity workforce development. Next slide. 
So there's two frameworks. Again, I just want to make sure that you're familiar with. One is the NIST cybersecurity framework or the framework for improving critical infrastructure. And it consists of the standards and the guidelines and the best practices to manage cybersecurity related risk. So it's the how and the what of cybersecurity. And then we have the workforce framework for cybersecurity or the NICE framework, which describes the work roles and the functions. So the who. So the NIST framework explains the what should be done and the NICE framework explains who should be doing that work. And um, so those are two frameworks that are very important and we'll be, hope, we'll be delving in a little bit about the NICE framework today. Next slide. Overall, there are 52 different work roles found in cybersecurity and it, the NICE framework helps describe to the learner what knowledge and skills are needed to perform specific tasks that are associated with those different work roles. And the key here, and it's so important for, for example, for this uh, webinar, is to help demystify exactly what options are available in cybersecurity. It's not just a one size fits all. It's not just directing students or, or folks that are looking, searching for jobs to um, computer science, or they must take co computer science classes or become an engineer, or they have to be real uh, technical you know, expert. There are multiple options. There are numerous pathways. And uh, a highlight is that cybersecurity has something for everyone. So this is really critical and something that NICE is working hard to expand uh, or to explain to the public so that we can expand the net even wider in growing, growing our workforce. And the next slide. So you'll see that if you explore the NICE framework and the different work roles, all of them have been assigned a work role ID that aligns with what some of you might be aware of the standard occupational classification or SOC code with the Department of Labor. I know some in the school systems are, are aware of uh, those particular, that pretty much guides um, a lot of the career and the exploration in high schools. Next slide. And of those, um, of all the different work roles and all of the knowledge and the skills that are outlined, there are six knowledge statements that are familiar across all 52 work roles. So when developing you know, frameworks and um, adopting curriculum and different opportunities, one could argue that these six are really core in all uh, students. It's not only for general cyber awareness for the public, but also to prepare students for all 52 work roles. And um, actually the Girl Scout badges were developed uh, around three of these six uh, knowledge statements. Next slide. And another um, tool you might find helpful, it was just recently updated, is cyberseek.org, which provide, provides detailed data about supply and demand in cybersecurity job market. Again, not only at the national level and the state level, but you can delve deeper into the regional. And it helps viewers see some common job titles and what type of work roles are in the highest demand in a certain area, the certifications requested. So that's really important um, to, to see what is available and the different options that are out there and the certifications and um, the need for a particular area and how that need can change or the flavor of cybersecurity can change depending on the geographic location. And the next slide. There's also a career um, a pathway tool to help users see potential pathways and salary ranges and the top skills requested. So that's another piece of this. And the last slide. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows that National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week, which started on Monday and goes through Saturday, is a way to really call attention to the contribution contributions to society and the innovations introduced by cybersecurity practitioners. But more importantly, the wide range of cybersecurity job opportunities, and I think that's what's going to be great about this particular panel that you'll be hearing about um, from today, is the different paths that they have taken, but also the different areas of cybersecurity that are available. So I really appreciate um, 
not only your effort in supporting National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week, but also for allowing me to share here today. So thanks so much, Jimmy. Listening and then if people want to access some of the events that you all have put on this week, they can go right here to the site on the screen and access some of the, the events that have been going on all week. I'll put it in the chat here as well. Oh, fantastic. I really appreciate that. Well, it's now my pleasure. We have a great lineup of panelists today. and We're about to get into a conversation about how people with a liberal arts or a non-technical, what I mean by non-technical, you're not a coder, you don't have an engineering background, but you went into a field working for a cybersecurity company. And so what I'd like to do, um, I'm gonna start with Ashley. Ashley, if you would kindly um, introduce yourself to the audience, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do for Palo Alto Networks. Sure, thanks, Jimmy. Um, hi, everybody, my name is Ashley Savaggio. I am currently the Program Manager for Social Impact at Palo Alto Networks. This is my 14th year in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, previously, I worked at Symantec Corporation, which is another cybersecurity company. Um, and, and eight of those years were, uh, the last eight years have been in corporate responsibility, which is a very exciting and very cool field that I'm excited to talk about later. Um, prior to that, I worked six years in corporate marketing, which was also really interesting and a really great way to learn about our products and how they all worked together and, um, and then when I first got out of college, I taught uh, high school English in Miami, Florida with Teach for America. I was an English major at Gonzaga University. And while I was teaching ninth grade, I also got my master's in teaching and learning at Nova Southeastern University, which is in Fort Lauderdale. I see, Ashley. And then for everyone listening, so you don't get confused, we have two Jimmys on the phone. I'm Jimmy Baker, and now I'm going to introduce Jimmy at Fortinet. Jimmy, kindly give us a little bit about your background. Thanks, Jimmy. Hi, everyone. I'm Jimmy Cove. Uh, thanks so much for being here today. So a little bit about my background. I'm a talent uh, acquisition programs manager. So I started my experiences back in college. I graduated from San Diego State University with a bachelor's of science with a marketing and HR and human and radio television film. I know that's a mouthful. Um, and then did my internship at uh, Symantec um, as an HR compliance uh, background um, in university relations. So from there on, after I graduated, I worked in a couple of different technical companies in Silicon Valley, so doing university relations. So in a way, I did get intertwined my background in marketing and HR, which I absolutely love working with students. And so that's what I'm doing now today as well at uh, Fortin. So managing the university relations program, as well as our employer branding and diversity inclusion. Thanks, Jimmy. Annie, kindly introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Jimmy. Hey, everyone. My name is Annie Ciccatelli. I lead higher ed business development at AWS. And so what I do is I work with our customers uh, to figure out how to, you know, meet their needs and solve their problems using cloud. Um, I, before that, was at uh, Amazon Retail on the Kindle side. Uh, and prior to that at uh, Blackboard and in a company called Wimba. So I'm always in technology, but the roles I've had are the roles that I'll be talking about today around product management and product marketing and business development uh, and, and what those roles do within a technology company and why they're so important. So I'm really excited to be here. Thanks, Annie. For my first question, um, I'm going to start with Ashley, and you had mentioned briefly in your introduction, I mean, you were a school teacher in Miami. You, you know, all through college and, uh, and, and to your graduate, you were probably thinking, I'm going to go this path. Can you talk to us a little bit about your journey from you were here, and then you went there, and what a career you have? And um, I think um, if you could just share with us what made you switch and how you leveraged your skills uh, and I believe your background's in English, how you leverage that into a career into cyber. Yeah, you know, um, all through college, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go into teaching or into mm -hmm. business in particular of marketing. Um, so I selected English as a major because it kind of opened up both paths for me. Um, and, you know, I learned so much while teaching. Um, 
it really taught me to think on my feet. You know, I was in sort of a chaotic school. So we had a block schedule where I would see one group of students on Monday and then the mm -hmm. other half on Tuesday. And uh, there was a number of days when I would show up on Tuesday and they'd be like, just kidding. You're going to see that first group that you just saw yesterday again today. Oh, wow. And they have their materials because they thought they were going to go to their other classes too. So <laughs> it definitely taught you to, you know, think on your feet, work hard, work fast, um, you know, always have a backup plan in mind. And those things have really um, served me well in my business career as well. Uh, when I finished my two-year commitment with, or excuse me, with uh, Teach for America, I wanted to move back to the Bay Area where I was from. And mm -hmm. just through networking, I took what I thought was going to be a three-month contract job working in customer references at Symantec, and that turned into 13 and a half years at that company. <laughs> oh, wow. So, it was definitely, I think you'll find with a lot of professionals, you, you know, you go into an experience expecting one thing and it, you know, it completely is a different thing. Um, I loved my time in marketing. I got to travel the world um interviewing our customers for videos um talking about their kind of case study their roi their success why they would pick semantic again um and really helping pitch that story to our sales folks so they could sell more of our products um so it was a really wonderful experience to learn really deeply about how some of the products worked while i was there um i got just you know, very involved with Symantec's corporate responsibility initiatives. So there was lots of opportunities to volunteer with charity on company time. So we, you know, we had the opportunity, charities would come on campus and you could attend a volunteer event, you know, just during lunch or, you know, go off site and, you know, help plant trees at some of the local parks, things like that. Um, and kind of in the meantime, I mean, that really was eye-opening for me because I didn't know that there was a whole you know, field of folks who did this type of work for companies to help them be, you know, really good corporate citizens. And um, I, I got very interested in that work. I started serving on the committee. Mm -hmm. And then when the job opened up, you know, they basically just called me and asked me if I wanted it. They didn't interview anyone. They didn't, um, <laughs> they, they were just like, hey, we need someone to do this. You clearly have already been doing it, you know, on the side. Um, would you like the job? And I was like, are you kidding? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it kind of shows you, you know, you never stop networking even internally. Um, and, you know, they already had proof of my work product and, and everything. So it was a really great uh, experience and I've loved every minute of corporate responsibility as well. Well, and Ashley, I want to pause there on corporate social responsibility. And I'd like to come back to it in a couple questions because I think a lot of people listening in today don't realize all the good that tech companies do, whether it's um, Splunk for good, the work that you all do at uh, Palo Alto. I mean, AWS has uh, Imagine a Better World Conference, which is, is truly one of the most inspiring events I've ever been to. So I want to come back in just a moment. We have a couple other questions coming in. Um, I want to switch over to Annie right now. Annie, I've had the opportunity to meet some of your team members, and many of them have different backgrounds that aren't tech. Matter of fact, I think one of them had a background in geography, you were telling me. Can you share with us how someone can better prepare themselves for a job that, that is in tech that isn't specifically technical in nature? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I currently have uh, one of my rock stars is a geography major. I also have an English major, actually a few English majors. Uh, shout out to them. I, um, I have some more technical folks too, who actually decided that, that the technical isn't where they, their passion lies. And I think that's okay too, right? Because I, I'm a believer in following your passion and not trying to fit something that isn't you. Um, and so we have a, a you know, just a, a diverse group of folks from, uh, from a backgrounds perspective. Um, I would say that, um, the, the, what ties them together, right. Is, uh, they are, these folks are really focused on understanding the customer and articulating the customer need, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't know what the, what the customer's problems are, if you don't know um, how these solutions help them, then you can't build them properly, right? And so mm -hmm. to have a whole technical organization work, you need to be able to develop those requirements, right? And you need to develop like the messaging. How do you explain really highly technical things in a mm -hmm. way that business leaders see that value, right? And that's a huge piece of what, 
is the engine behind technology companies. It's interesting, early in my career, um, I, you know, I think I was reading an article and it, it was somebody saying like how to really, um, you know, propel your career. And it said to become an expert at an mm -hmm. industry or a certain type of customer segment, right? Because that's really, if you become an expert at this type of customer, there's going to be a lot of different technology companies who are looking to serve that customer, right? And so I think that's one place is find an area or find an industry or a segment. I went with higher ed. I thought it was fascinating, right? I still mm -hmm. think it's fascinating, but that's one way that you can lean into that or understanding the dynamics um, of that customer segment. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, in terms of what people can do to continue to evolve themselves and prepare, um, I know it's old school, but I would say, you know, my team, the best folks on my team, they read a lot from a lot of different things. And I don't mean like they're reading fiction at night, like they probably do that too, but that's not the reading I'm talking about, but they have um, a, they, they always are looking at what's happening in, in technology news, or maybe it's just higher ed news, uh, but there's this element of staying up to date as things change and then drawing inspiration from those things. So I mm -hmm. think that, you know, it sounds basic, but really read a lot. You're going to get a lot of information. Like I, you know, get news and subscribe to those things, like the information, right? You're going to get tech news from that. Um, I think that that's really important. Um, I do think there's something, there's a difference between being like a technical person in terms of I'm a developer or I'm, you know, delivering a service, like a, I'm writing a service or code and to be technically competent. I do think we, everyone should kind of continue to try to be technically competent. I laugh all the time. Like when I was in college, it was a long time ago. Uh, there was a class, it was physics for poets at Columbia, right? And I swear, I don't know if it's still there, but it was like, when you think about it, like, what are some basic things that like, you know, are good to know about physics, physics for poets. Right. And I would love to see, and it probably exists, but like, there's just some basic technology that would be that course, right? Of like, you know, the, the basics of what you would need to know to be competent to understand these products. And so, I think that the keeping yourself just at a surface level of that also, you know, I think will go a long way to understanding the products that you're trying to either build or sell. I think that I think that's a great answer. And as someone who came from a liberal arts background, I do do a lot of reading and um, just to stay up to things. But there ultimately comes that time. And for everyone listening, our national audience you're gonna have someone also that sees the value of those skills and helps you forge a path forward. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, Jimmy, um, you are in recruiting for Fortinet. And what I'd like you to do, um, explain to us a little bit about what Fortinet does. And then what are some tips that you could give anyone wanting to join, say a cybersecurity company like Fortinet with a liberal uh -huh. arts background? Absolutely. So um, for those of you who don't know who we are, I'm happy to share more with you. Um, I actually joined Fortinet about, um, gosh, uh, 10 months ago. And uh, so we're a leading global cybersecurity company. We've been around for 20 years when IPO, just about 10 years ago. And uh, we're, our headquarters is actually off in uh, Sunnyvale, uh, California, if you're familiar, but we have mm -hmm. headquarters all around the globe. Um, our story started... Um, Gosh, uh, 20 years ago with the brothers of Michael and Kenzie who started their passion in cybersecurity uh, at, uh, in Canada. So that's where our research and development offices um, are still located today. Um, but we, we, we've come here to California, we expanded into Asia and Europe, so all over the place and really, um, really excelling and, and doing well. Um, so we're a, uh, you know, we, we cover so many different spectrum in cybersecurity, so many different entities. And I mentioned to you briefly earlier that I was an intern at um, Symantec. So I'm not sure if you remember the Norton antivirus. So when you have a PC, you go out and buy, you know, the software at Best Buy or, or Fry's or whatnot. Yes, sure. I do remember. You, you remember that. <laughs> yeah. And so, so now that sort of just kind of dwindled to the side. And so here at Fortinet, we cover so many different um, cybersecurity threats, so many malicious threats from academia to 
you know, other uh, technology companies in the industry. So we do so many different things. And if you're interested, I encourage you to look, look read more about us. Uh, but for anyone, um, I always tell this to university students or anyone who's looking in an industry where opportunities is, uh, you know, don't be afraid to challenge yourself. I think one of the best thing is to, uh, you know, again, on top of reading, also take on extra curriculum. So when I look at a resume for per se, I always like to see that what is this person's story looks like? How is that tied all together? And I would say, if you are interested in cybersecurity, you know, whether take a course, um, you know, take an online course like Udemy, or even um, log on to our career website or, or corporate website at Fortinet, we have a free certification called Network Security Expert. And it's free. Um, I love it. And so when people take that, it just shows how serious you are. And that's the first step to showcasing that, hey, I'm interested. It doesn't really matter what background you have, um, because I come from a uh, sort of unconventional background, per se. When I had an internship at Symantec at, as an HR compliance intern, I wasn't too sure what that was. Um, but then I sort of raised my hand and dabbled onto university relations in HR department. So that's what I mean when challenging yourself, really not afraid to, to try new things. And so that's how I developed my passion along the way and somehow found my career opportunity uh, throughout all the years as I'm fortunate um, doing university relations or leading the program in itself. Um, so that's, that's, that's sort of my tidbit here is to really build your story, um, you know, whether you're taking a courses, um, whether you're doing higher education and you're taking courses, highlight them. Um, you know, why do you like cybersecurity? Talk more about that story be done on a side. Um, if not, you know, take the, the free certification that I, sh that I share with you. It's called the Network Security Expert Program at Fortinet. Thanks, yeah, I Jimmy. Echo, I echo what Jimmy said, like around looking at if you're applying to a cybersecurity company, they almost always have a certification course that's not that intense. Like, I think it's really important. That's a really good point. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you all on that. And, you know, it's interesting. I work for a university that has a cybersecurity institute, and we do a lot of training for government, law enforcement, military, academia. And one of our most popular courses that we teach are the basics. You know, what does phishing mean? H how does cybersecurity impact me? But what a lot of people don't realize today is that Cyber is not its own vertical. Cyber covers every industry. It impacts whether, you know, um, from the moment we get up in the morning and pick up our phones, we are working in a cyber space. Now, I want to come back to something uh, that we had talked about at the beginning. And I, to me, this is something that I didn't realize early on in my career that existed. But I want to talk about this term corporate social responsibility. There are a lot of companies out there that will have a for good title with their name or they'll do things to help people grow in technology. And I would ask, um, I'm gonna start with Ashley on this, but you know, Davina, Jimmy, Annie, feel free to chime in, but can you talk, uh, Ashley, would you share with us, you know, what it is, what do you do on a day-to-day -day in corporate social responsibility? And, and what does that mean in like kind of simple terms? What does someone in your position do and how does it, you know, really have the betterment of humankind and, and the results? Yeah, so a lot of tech companies um, are very invested in this concept. And I, I think really it started kind of with Mark Benioff at Salesforce, who really developed this kind of framework where as a company, they were going to contribute dollars to charities mm -hmm. and communities where their employees live and work, but also the time of their employees. So allow their employees to volunteer, whether that's a hands-on going to the food bank and, and creating some boxes or a pro bono opportunity, but they're using those skills that a nonprofit may not have the ability to hire it out, but can get for free from, through, the, through the technology company as well as free product. So, you know, um, a lot of com tech companies will allow nonprofits free access or very low, co low cost access to their product as part of their corporate responsibility. Um, at Palo Alto, we kind of have these three pillars here um, and that's around environment, community work and then you know supplier diversity and advancing the industry so that's ensuring things that you know in in a lot of tech we're not using materials that are from conflict areas conflict minerals for example um, but also ensuring that all of the companies that we're using as vendors are diverse and not just you know um, one particular you know kind of uh, skill set. So there's lots of opportunities. Things that I handle um, for um, Palo Alto is all around the social impact, so that middle 
um, image there. And we do things like providing volunteer opportunities for our employees, but also grant making. So we partner with nonprofits, particularly in the space of diversifying the tech workforce. So not just for our future employees, but the entire cybersecurity workforce. So our customer workforces, our partner workforces, because it's so important um, that we have diverse voices at the table to help make our products better and more secure, right? If everybody's approaching with kind of the same, um, you know, way of thinking and, and, and uh, you know, background, you know, the products themselves can't be to their highest potential. So there's a lot of reasons that, um, tech companies in particular really have adopted this. You know, it's such a fight for talent. Um, people really wanna feel like they're working for a company that has a strong mission, which the cybersecurity field in general already does, right? You feel like you're working for one of the good guys, helping protect the world mm -hmm. in general. So as a company mission, it's generally a great option, but also people wanna feel like their company gives back and they're part of, you know, a, a you know, a company that's trying to help make the world a better place. And so that's, you know, a lot of what I do is running around programs that help our employees, you know, get more invested with charities that they care about, as well as the charities that are important to kind of our long-term business development as well. Thanks, Ashley. And uh, we'll give the other panelists if they want to chime in on this, but I even, uh, one of the neat things at our Cyber Institute is we work with multiple organizations like uh, the Global Emancipation um, network and helping fight human trafficking. And it's amazing the things that you can apply machine data, tech, and to, to help do for good causes. So I know that's something that's really important. Um, I wanted to pause real quick. Um, I know that AWS does uh, the Imagine a Better World conference. Uh, I wanted to give Annie, Jimmy, as well as Davina, if you also wanted to chime in on, uh, you know, tech for good and what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things we're doing at AWS. So I would not do it justice uh, other than saying, I think the other thing to talk about in this realm, it, it also relates back to careers, um, is we have a lot of people doing curriculum development, right? Mm -hmm. And and part of that is to, when you think about workforce development, right? And that being a social good. And uh, and it's a, we have you know we have a ton of folks who are working on making sure that we're able to deliver courses so people who want to do this as a career people who just mm -hmm. want to be fluent are able to do that. So I wanted to mention that. Thanks, Annie. Uh, any of the other panelists want to comment on that before I go to the next question? I mean, the only thing I would like to say is like one of sure. the key projects that I work on is, uh, is cybersecurity curriculum for kids ages five mm -hmm. to 15. So, you know, we put that out there and any school can download those lessons and, and give them to their students to make sure that, you know, the whole world is more cyber aware and has better cyber hygiene and is aware of things of like, what are phishing? How do I have a strong password? All of those things. So mm -hmm. um, it's a really exciting way for me to, although I was an English major, right? I am, I am providing in some of these cases, like the cybersecurity education, I'm still teaching. Um, I'm empowering our employees to teach as well. And um, I think that's a really great application for someone who's not so technical. Like these are concepts and things that I can teach even though I can't code um, that really help, I think the world, you know, ensure it help helping to make sure that the world is safer every single day. No, that's a great point. And I think just for anyone listening today, if you if you're concer concerned about our world and social ca causes, um, whether uh, it doesn't matter what is, there's a way to leverage technology. And I hope that this has opened up your eyes that there might be a, a career path for you at a technology company. You know, my, um, my next question, um, I wanna hit the, uh, flip this over to Jimmy. Jimmy, what right now, um, I mean, you're out talking with college students all the time, you're recruiting for Fortinet. What are some of the entry-level positions that you have seen for folks with a liberal arts background? Um, that's a really good question, Jimmy. And, uh, you know, just tying back to the um, educational piece, I, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, with my cohort, I know Maurice um, is our educational programs manager who leads the education piece um, for our um, academy. So that's something that if anyone's interested, again, it ties back to that uh, opportunity to learn whether you come from a non-technical background. But for those who I've seen and talked um, and shared quite a bit are um, 
The role that I heavily see, I think this would all probably be um, uh, uh, you know, related to our topics today is that uh, the business development role that I see, mm -hmm. um, we have such a great organization at Fortinet and we're expanding quite massively actually. Um, and what I love about this role, and I can dabble into other roles as well, is that business development, you, you don't have to be in a, um, you know, in any, uh, um, I don't, a technical major, you can come from any different type of majors and still be very successful. So I, I, what I see um, in students is that if you chose a psychology major or you know, whether an English major or history major, but you mm -hmm. love to connect and you have, I, I heard someone earlier said that they came from a retail background, so I have I uh, working at the Apple store. So if you translate that really well to people and really connect um, and can showcase your story and really, um, you know, tell a story, but also be tenacious. I think those are some of the key ingredients to doing really well in this role. And I have seen that at Fortunate where people have just come right in, you know, whether it's for an entry level role or someone who just really want to explore careers at, at, at Fortunate, um, you know, they've taken off. I, I mean, I've seen them won so many different awards and then also dabble into marketing. So, you know, the, the world is your oyster. So if you come in and really do well, you know, you can certainly grow in a career at cybersecurity, especially at Fortunate. No, I, I definitely agree with you. And even on my own journey, um, I, I was a newspaper ad salesperson and we had um, someone in my network said, we really need people that aren't afraid to cold call and we'll go talk to people. But what they had to do with me, I had a great writing and communications background, but I spent uh, about a month and a half. I literally went out into our warehouse and was assembling computers. So I knew and this is in the 90s. So how a network worked, uh, how you put memory in and all that. And then because I was going to be in the federal government, when a lot of people don't realize, you know, the, the federal government is one of the world's largest buyers of tech service. Their budget for next year is about 90 billion. And I had to actually go to federal acquisition regulation school and had to learn how to how the government thinks. And then you basically combined what I learned about networks with government plus communications, and I was able to move forward. I started out as a marketing support rep uh, in the 90s, and that's how um, I went on this. You know, one of the things too, um, I, and this is, this is a question for Annie, and then we're going to, uh, just for everyone in the audience listening after this question, we're going to open it up to you all to answer some, uh, some of your questions that have been coming in over the uh, screen here the last few minutes. But Talk to me, you have a geography major on your team. What are the key traits, um, you know, beyond function competency that you look for? And I also know that Amazon um, has 14 leadership principles. And anybody that I know at Amazon, these aren't just like stuff you read on a website. Like, I mean, y'all live by those principles. And it's, it's, it's very important that culture that you have. So talk to us a little bit about what you're looking. Let's just say we have a liberal arts major listening. I know we have a bunch of students listening in today and they have something that they feel is so unrelated and they see a job at AWS. What are you looking for in their background? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Jimmy, I'm really glad you brought up uh, the leadership principles because I was going to specifically talk about those. So for those of you who don't know, if you want to look at it now, Google Amazon leadership principles. Um, and uh, you know, I really learned uh, about hiring when I came to Amazon four years ago. Like I thought I knew it, I was wrong. Like I definitely really learned how to assess talent quickly um, and how to dive in. What, what are those key things that we're looking for? Um, so in addition to customer obsession, which is like the pinnacle leadership mm -hmm. principle, which I kind of talked about before is understanding the customer. Um, there are two others that I, I personally look for in my roles that, that, um, that combined really make like a super strong cocktail of, mm -hmm. of, of talent. And it's uh, learn and be curious is one of ours, right? And the other one is dive deep. And so learn and be curious, you know, as we all know, technology changes, right? And when I got my degree, it's totally different at that, at the point in time. And so it's, and it's only going to change at a faster rate, I would predict going forward. And so you, you have to hire someone who wants to just keep learning because they're not going to know. They're not going to know. Even the people who are tech majors are not going to know, right? And so mm -hmm. that ability to 
you know, be curious, not just learn because you have to, but you're like, you're actually curious. Like, how does it work? Why does it do that? Like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, that is one of the key traits uh, that we look for. You know, I always joke that like, we're looking for that kid who took apart their first bicycle because they wanted to figure it out. Like that's like, that's the, the mindset that we really try to look for. Um, and then as I said, the second one is dive deep, which is like a little bit more uh, traditional around under investigating. Like mm -hmm. um, for all of you who also don't know Amazon culture, uh, we don't do PowerPoint internally. It's like not allowed, right? And everything is in a written document. And we believe that in order to really make a decision, you have to really understand it and you have to dive in. We don't believe in headlines. We don't believe in sound bites. You can easily be led down a, a path without really thinking around the corners and understanding, you know, is this a one-way door? Is this a two-way door? And so that ability to dive deep with learn and be curious makes for really a problem solver, right? No matter what the problem is, right? You're gonna be able to get to the bottom to it and make recommendations. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about business writing, especially at Amazon. Uh, and I really do chalk it up. Like I think part of my success at this company is because I write well, right? Um, because you are expected to be able to communicate your ideas, especially complex ideas in a succinct way for others to understand. Um, and that is really important. So that's the other skill I wanna make sure to, to talk about. I'm not talking like, pretty creative writing. Like I'm horrible at that. Like if you ask me to write a nursery rhyme or a story, like I can't, like no adjectives, like it has to be, here's my hypothesis because I, because of X, Y, and Z data, thus we're going to go do this. Like that's the type of writing I'm talking about. And I want to add that to that too. And I think that's such a great point. Uh, you know, writing is so important because you, you'll be on your email and you're writing, uh, you know, to customers, whether you're partners or team, it's so important to translate and, and really make sure that's transparent. So I absolutely agree with that. No, great, uh, great feedback. And, you know, it's interesting too, at our cybersecurity institute, you would think that we just only hire kids from the technical disciplines, but some of our best students to come through here um, have specialized in videography, um, English teaching, and we're able to use some of those liberal arts schools. And what we do for our team, um, we actually host something called, it's monthly, it's called Cyber Monday Lunches. And we explain what's going on in our market because there's such a, you know, this is changing. Um, there's a lot of experts that are talking right now that the 20s are gonna become the decade of tech because of the emergence into machine data, learning and all this other stuff going on. So for anyone coming into the marketplace, there really is a way if you get curious and you, you can leverage what you've done in your background and put it to work towards a cybersecurity company. Now we've had, um, we're right about 10 minutes uh, to the tip of the hour. We're gonna stay on a few minutes extra. Um, our event got off to a little bit of a late start. So we're, we're back in gear. If you'll bear with us, we've had a lot of the audience stay through us, but I want to open it up to your questions. And one of the first questions that came through, it's for Ashley, it's, pro, it's from Professor uh, Pat McQuaid, and she wants to know what your cyber kid resources are. And I'm thinking, are, is that the uh, cyber aces you all have program? I think that is, yeah, that's kind of what I was mentioning earlier. So we worked with um, cyber.org, which was formerly mm -hmm. nice to develop 16 lessons that are for kids ages five to 15. I dropped a link into the chat, but it's paloaltonetworks.com slash cyber aces. Okay. And um, they're all about 45 minutes long, but they can be extended if you want to have someone talk a little bit about their career and their journey. Or, you know, if you don't have that much time, you can eliminate one of the activities. But uh, they're really, really well done. I recommend uh, for everybody to check them out and to spread the word amongst students ages five to 15. We also have, um, Jimmy, was when, Jimmy was mentioning their academy program at Fortinet. We mm -hmm. also have an academy program for um the undergraduate program. And there's even some courses for kids that are kind of in the high school level. So we really take people from like five to, you know, graduating from college um, in the cybersecurity awareness arena. Excellent. Anyone else on the panel, panel like to comment on that question before uh, I go to the next one? I just wanted to add to uh, Ashley's point, a lot of the free resources that we're here. 
Um, and so just to tie back to uh, you know, Fortinet Network Security Expert uh, program or Fortinet Academy program. So we also partner with um, academies as well as high schools as well for um, anyone who's interested in wanting to become certified. Um, so we offer a program, uh, a NSC training from one to eight, um, eight being very technical, but um, if anyone's interested in wanting to start out and, and learn about the foundation of cybersecurity, I would recommend the Network Security Expert one and two. Um, which that's what I have on my LinkedIn. So anyone can do that as well, but um, it's on our career website or corporate website. Yeah, and I'd, I'd also suggest to anyone out there, I mean, NICE has so many resources that you can, you can begin with. And, you know, our university, we recently did a cybersecurity competition and we based it on the NICE framework. And so what's really interesting, when you, when you get into the tech world, you'll see different things that are either, um, regulated or advised. And if you can bring people up on a standard that's in existing, it's a really good resource to begin looking at. Um, this is a really interesting question that came in and I wanted to make sure that we address this. Um, what about people that serve in the military? Where can they apply their training to work in cybersecurity? And so um, I'm gonna answer that one and, and then I'm gonna open, I'm gonna flip it over to you all. But what's really interesting, so my, my director of my cyber institute is a former lieutenant colonel uh, in the Air Force. My program manager is a um, former Marine captain. And so what I see um, with, you know, depending on the different branches of military is that there is an ability to see problems, figure out a tactical execution and move a path forward. And um, there are a lot of opportunities out there for military people in training. And I'd like to you know, pause for a moment and allow the, the panel to comment on that question as well. I could definitely speak to that. So um, I'm from a military family. My brother is still in the military and still work. And actually both my brother and my sister work in cybersecurity as well. So we're like the cybersecurity siblings. <laughs> but um, I would highly recommend anyone with uh, military experience look at Vets in Tech. Uh, Palo Alto Networks also has a program called Second Watch to help um, veterans transition into cybersecurity as well. There are so many amazing resources out there and it's a really natural fit. I think um, I think about people like my brother who are really in, interested in protecting the world mm -hmm. and this is a, a natural next step for that. Yeah, yeah that's, a, uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, anyone else like to comment on that before I go to the next one? Yeah, I want to add to that too. Just yesterday, I posted a, a post on LinkedIn about uh, our veterans program at Fortinet. And so we're uh, one of the, um, you know, we're, we do everything in-house. And so we have a, a robust and lucrative um, veterans program. So you come through our training program. So this is for anyone who's a, a veteran or, um, or their military spouses. And actually in my last, last few um, job, um, my manager was, uh, in the military. So working under mm -hmm. someone who has that vision, who's very strong and, uh, and knows, you know, knows how to lead a team is very exciting. So I can share my experience as well, but I, I love working with him um, back at um, my last, last company at VMware. Um, but um, please do check out our website on, on veterans program of anyone who's a, a vet um, and, and their military spouses. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, this next question, Davina, I'm gonna, ask you to take a stab at this one and you might have to get offline with the proof because it's a pretty detailed question but well, they have here um they're currently um they're in silicon valley and they're a company and they're required to meet nist sp 800-171 and then cmmc level three and they have here they're making good progress but they're looking for resources on how to build a company starting here and i guess what they're looking for is how do they and I don't know if that's something you want to take offline and give them some resources or if you can give them a good starting point. Yeah, so uh, definitely I can give them the direct, uh, okay. figure out what particular needs. We have uh, small business resources on the NIST website. NIST framework has a um, wealth of resources, uh, how others have used it and so forth. So there's lots of resources there, but I'm happy to to send them the direct links if they want. That would be 
that would be great. We are right at the tip of the hour. Like I mentioned, we got off to a little bit of a late start. So we're just going to stay on for five more minutes. We're going to take a couple more questions. We're going to keep the dashboard open for you. One of the questions, and I thought this is a really good one that came in, is um, um, it's can you specifically share with us how majors like English, communications, or history are working in, in cybersecurity? And so, um, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm interested is, uh, I mean, we have an English major here on the panel. Um, my background's communication journalism. Uh, Jimmy was in marketing, but share specifically how um, someone on that journey, like say you're an English student, what kind of things can you be doing right now to maybe open up and start looking at uh, cybersecurity? You know, Annie, you mentioned about writing well. There's an assumption there that I think an English student could probably write well or, or grab ideas, but let's just take a pause. So they're wanting to know, can you share specifically how some of these majors are, are leveraging their backgrounds and working with you like English communications and history? I'll open it up to the panel. Um, so I love to take on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've seen a lot of folks coming from uh, a communications background. So, uh, and, and that's a, a great background to have because we have a lucrative uh, PR team as well. So our social media team is, is quite, um, uh, collaborative, I would say that they love writing and they love producing content, whether it's on the corporate side mm -hmm. or on the employer branding side. So there's always room for opportunities, um, at least here for Fortinet. Um, so, you know, we, we love people who are just dedicated, who wants to push themselves and really not afraid of challenges. Um, but anyone who comes from a communi communication background, literature, um, art, maybe, you know, again, like I mentioned to you, our business development role, our are open year round. So if anyone who loves just connecting and, and really solving problems, that's also an opportunity, but that's translates to more of a sales type of role. But if you love writing, if you love, um, you know, just creating stories, um, I would say a PR, which we do have, um, social mm -hmm. media team is quite popular there. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Anyone else like to comment on that? Yeah, there's so many roles in marketing. You know, I worked in that in that industry or that field for six years. And, you know, the, you had people interviewing customers and developing. I mean, we developed case studies, videos, uh, podcasts, uh, print, uh, you know, items, all, all kinds of that stuff to, mm -hmm. really, um, you know, do a lot of writing. Um, but, you know, there's also roles for folks in, in that space to do things like campaign management. So <clears throat> you really need to understand the voice of the customer that Annie was talking about um, earlier and really have that empathy and that true understanding of what do they want? What do they need? You know, how can you cut through the clutter to really help them understand your message? So there's so many different types of opportunities for English majors in cybersecurity. And I highly recommend everybody check that out because I really feel it's such an exciting, dynamic, growing, well-compensated field. It's really fantastic. And I really highly recommend it to everybody. All right. We're going to end with this last question that just came in. I, I think it's worth uh, answering. It's from Luke. And bear with me as I read this. I'll, I'll I have extensive experience in product marketing and field marketing, and I'm looking to transition into a full-time role in product marketing for a cyber startup or corporate. I've recently completed the graduate certificate in cyber risk management at Georgetown. I'm having a hard time getting responses from the recruiters and the ones I have spoken to, to note that I have no experience in cyber. I'm I am mid-career and not in a position to take an internship at this stage. Do you have suggestions on ways to make my uh, CV stand out? And so, um, you know, Luke, first thing I'll say right now is um, not that you need to hear this excuse, but the, the pandemic has changed hiring. I mean, there's a lot of companies out there, but it's there are a lot of organizations right now where the it's, it's a little bit slower. So that's something that's going on. But, you know, um, I'll, I'll open this up to the panel. So Luke is in mid-career. He's looking to increase more cyber education and take that um, experience he has in field marketing um, to a cyber company. What advice do we have for him? Um, I'll go ahead. Um, um, Jimmy, Annie, yeah, uh, sure. do you all want to take a, a stab at that question? Sure. And uh, thanks so much for your question. Um, 
you know, it's kind of uh, hard to, to, to not see your resume, but what my advice is when I share with everyone earlier is if you truly want to get into an organization such as Fortunate, uh, you know, take advantage of the free certification, right? Because it really shows recruiters um, that you are serious, that you're interested, um, and then also tie that back to your role as a field specialist or whether it's product, right? So it has to somehow connect in a way, but I think that's the first step is to really showcase that, um, you know, you are taking advantage of the certification or, you know, taking other opportunities as well to show that you are wanting to get into cybersecurity. So hopefully that helps, um, but yeah, it's a little bit challenging to not be able to see your resume and, and, and give that feedback. Well, and I, I think any of us would be open to talking to, to you as well, if you want to, you know, share that information uh, as well. Um, anyone else want to respond to that? Someone wanting to transition with a, with a, with a Marcom background before we uh, yeah, wrap I mean, up? I would say, um, and this is more broad, so I don't know how mm -hmm. helpful it is, but, um, you know, we see it a lot, especially at larger companies. So this doesn't really apply to a smaller company. If you're looking to get into a bigger company, you know, um, this is kind of a secret of Amazon. It's we do a lot of internal transfers, right? And so sometimes the most important thing is to get in, right? And if you believe in like your capabilities, that you'll grow, that you'll extend, that you'll get new opportunities because good talent does get rewarded, uh, especially at, at companies like this. So my recommendation is it might not be your dream job at the company, but like mm -hmm. get into the company, um, lateral move, whatever that looks like, uh, and, and go from there. Yeah, that is such good advice. I fully agree. And, and that's what I tell a lot of people who are interested in getting into corporate responsibility, because actually that's a very similar um, issue is people want to get in, but you don't have experience. Um, and, you know, that's exactly how I did it. I was in the company and I kind of started doing things on the side. So, you know, contact, you know, the, your cybersecurity folks in your company and maybe have an informational interview with them and just get to know them, understand what they do, see if there's anything you can do to help them on the side, you know, um, you know, Google's famous 20% projects, right? Um, I think a lot of people are, um, a lot of managers are willing to help their people grow that way as well. Thanks, Ashley. All right, we are going to get ready to wrap up for today, I just want to take a quick pause. You know, an event like this just doesn't happen automatically. There's a lot of prep, a lot of things that go into planning and executing this. And I, I know you can't hear it, but you can hear a clap for me. I just want to thank our panelists, uh, you know, everyone from all around America. We've been getting a lot of positive uh, things coming through the chat, but I want to thank Annie, Davina, Ashley, and Jimmy uh, for spending some time with us. I also want to encourage you, National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week is not over yet. There is another event that I hope you'll join us with tomorrow. Um, a very long story short, but tomorrow at 9 a.m., Cal Poly and NICE will be providing a demo of a virtual cyber competition we hosted last month. Picture your favorite video game with a cyber mystery challenge to figure out how the satellite was hacked and crashed to Earth. We're going to actually have an exercise that if you're listening in, you can do this. This is great for um, students and people that want to learn more about uh, the convergence of space and cybersecurity and watch a national competition that we held uh, virtually. So that'll be tomorrow. You can take a quick picture of the screen here. I've also put up some information here if you wanna stay informed. I know there was a lot of things going through the chat. We'll leave that open for just another second if you didn't get to copy some of those links, but these are some great ways too that you can stay informed through newsletters or information. But again, I wanna thank you, our audience, for joining us for a riveting discussion. I appreciate your questions and insight on this topic. I'm Jimmy Baker on behalf of Cal Poly's California Cybersecurity Institute. Thank you and make it a great day. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.